25 to 9. Hilton Quayle is the president of the Children's Court and this is what he said in court yesterday. Uh, this is the direct quote. He says, when you treat a damaged child like an animal, they will behave like one. And if you want to make a monster, then this is how you do it. Now, he was referring to a 15-year-old boy who'd been kept in solitary confinement in a glass-walled cell for 79 days, including on Christmas Day. For almost half that time, he was not allowed to leave the cell at all for any reason. Judge Quayle described that treatment as illegal and dehumanising. So why did it happen? Let's ask Dr Adam Thomason. He's the Director General of the Department of Justice. Good morning and thank you for your time. Good morning, Nadia. They are damning comments. Um, how, um, and they are coming from the President of the Children's Court. How do you respond to them this morning? Look, they are damning comments. I guess um, my first response when I heard them and with yesterday was uh, we provided, of course, the judge with a number of reports so he could um, assess this young person in terms of his offending or, or what he wanted to do with that young person. Um, since that those comments were made, I've asked for a review of that particular matter and I've also had a quick look at some of the data we provided, which seems to me it's not particularly well written. We have, a, we have an issue with that young person. I don't think um, his treatment will be described as um, um, meeting the standards we need to meet, but I'm also not sure that we gave the judge the best information as to what's happening and whether he was actually out of his cell um, more often than what um, uh, was, was indicated in the paperwork. So, I want, look, I want to I review into what's actually happened with the matter. We want to treat young people in our care um, as best we're able to, uh, and so, obviously, I'm taking it very seriously. Uh, can you confirm that that 15-year-old boy was kept in that 10-metre by 20-metre room for 79 days in solitary confinement? <laughs> I can confirm he was in the intensive supervision unit and those those sort of cells that you're talking about, he, he would have been in there. Yes, I can confirm that. I can't confirm until I've seen um, a follow-up from the department as to the precise number of days, but I'm, I'm certainly prepared to say he was in that unit for some period of time and there are reasons for that. And I'm not going to go into this young person's behaviour uh, as an individual in our custody, but um, the intensive supervision unit is used basically for two reasons. It's used firstly for young people who are self-harming or at risk of self-harm so we can monitor their behaviour. And it's also used when young people are uh, harming others, or whether they be staff or other detainees, whether they're doing damage to cells uh, or climbing fences. And so we, we use that unit for a mix of purposes. The period of time he was in there is a long period of time, if it's correct, uh, and I want to look into that as to why that is. The reality is, to get into Banksia Hill, you've got to you've got to work at it. You've got to have either serious offending or alleged serious offending happening or a history of offending. The young people who come into our care are... They're not coming from good backgrounds. Um, they often come in with um, alcohol and drug issues, cognitive and learn learning disabilities, mental health concerns, including self-harm, which is particularly concerning. And we're trying to manage these young people. And since last year, we've had a cohort of young people coming in who've exhibited very challenging behaviours, whether it be assaulting others or hurting themselves. And trying to manage that has certainly been difficult for us. It's certainly been difficult for our staff and it's affecting our staff too. And I'm just trying to do, as are all my staff, trying to do the best we can to manage that cohort. How, including how, this young person. OK, uh, just on that point, he has been diagnosed with ADHD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, FASD. He's got anxiety disorders. Now, Judge, Judge Quayle acknowledged that this boy um, does have behaviours that are difficult to manage and has um, is accused of committing crimes in the community. Uh, this boy has admitted to assaulting your officers 19 times, spitting, kicking, throwing urine on them. Um, but he then did say, when you treat a damaged child like an animal, they'll behave like one. And if you want to make a monster, then this is how you do it. Uh, do you concede this was the best way to deal with this boy? Do you accept those comments from Judge Quayle? Well, I have to accept the judge's comments in the sense that he's made them. He's on record. That's his view. My own view is that we have a lot, a long, a long way to go or significant work to do to make sure we maintain the appropriate standards of care for all young people in our care at Banksia. Generally speaking, Banksia works quite well. As I've said, at the moment, there's a cohort in there, which you also would have heard from police reports, some um, who are committing quite serious crimes out in the community and they're coming into Banksia higher numbers and we're trying to manage that as best we're able to. Can, can we do better? Absolutely. Do we have to do better? Absolutely. Uh, that's probably all I can say about that individual, that individual at this point.
Okay, well, what we do also know about this individual, because it was in court and people are asking, um, he's been in state care since he was about eight and he was sent back to detention after breaching a previous community order for breaking into a home in Balladura and robbing an 82-year-old man of $2,000 with an adult co-accused in Morley in August. So uh, when you look at the kind of people coming into Banksia Hill, is, it, it, do you, is that kind of um, crime that he's accused of in the more serious, at the more serious end. Look, um, yes, I'll say yes. There are there are young people who commit more serious offences. Um, the reality is, most young people in Banksy would be in for a mix of uh, a range of say vehicular offences, like you know stealing cars, um, aggravated burglaries, um, physical assaults, sometimes sexual assault, and it, often it's not about. An individual matter that ends up with a young person spending time in Banksia can often be because they've actually got a long history of offending and other other things in the community have failed to sort of get them off the pathway. As you said, um, it's reported this young person was in the care of the state. Uh, it's not unusual at all to have young people from very dysfunctional backgrounds um, committing uh, antisocial behaviour and then going into criminal behaviour as well. And um, we have to then manage that. It's, um, and those young people more than we would like, we'll actually then um, spend some time in uh, the youth justice system and also potentially in the adult system. Um, the important thing there is to divert them into an appropriate sort of uh, system before they get to Banksy or go any further in, in their criminal justice sort of uh, pathway, and that's hard to do. Um, but they're often very, very uh, disturbed young people. Uh, and the other thing which is playing into it at the moment is also though there's... Uh, uh, like a social media competition between young people to commit offences, almost like gaining points, like a treasure hunt almost, and that's fueling a whole range of new behaviours we haven't really seen before, um, and, and also some quite violent offending. Uh, and this is also playing out, I'll say this, it's playing out in Banksia Hill as well, where you've got competitions to do things like, you know, ascend fences or damage units or assault staff, or, and also at times uh, to self-harm. And that's incredibly disturbing, and we're doing the best we can to manage all that. Um, we're obviously calling on resources beyond Banksia Hill to do that. Uh, I've put in additional staff. Um, we've worked with uh, CPSU CSA on, on, to, on our staffing model, and we're looking to still improve that. I've run uh, one course of 21 new staff last October came on board. Two courses are currently going for youth custodial officers now, and I've got two more courses planned for uh, early this year. Uh, we're looking at our model of care to make sure we make it as therapeutic as we can. We're looking at our infrastructure, upgrading that where we can, but we're also looking to repair the damage that's done on a regular basis by young people. So we've got to balance the security of the facility with being as therapeutic as possible. I'll say this, at the moment, it's very hard to run all our therapeutic programs when uh, a number of young people are acting out in various ways and it has to be managed as well. It's not an easy situation. Uh, I think my staff are doing absolutely the best they can and we're looking at more solutions going forward. Um, that's probably all I can tell you at the moment. The, this boy, th that, mm -hmm. that is the focus of this interview today, was mm -hmm. he part of that competition that you talk about where they're actively um, competing to damage, self-harm, all those things that you just outlined? Was he part of that? Is that one I... of the reasons why he's in was in that cell? <laughs> Look, I actually don't know, but I can say he was in that cell because of either self-harm and or the assaults which you've referred to from the court, the uh, court transcript. And, and, and the issue then in the eyes of, of the, the Children's Court President, though, is that th there's bare minimum standards that the court mm -hmm. expects and, mm -hmm. and Judge Quayle is saying they weren't met on this occasion. Yep. Is that fair? And, well, he said that and I think um, it's... Um, I, at this point, I can't, I can't deny we have issues. I'm going to look into it to see precisely how, how far off standard we were. Now, I don't know all the details of this young person, as I've said, but um, what, what the judge has said, he said it. I'm not going to take it, um, you know, sort of just, just bypass it. I'm going to take it seriously, and we're going to look into that young person's experience and see where we can improve it, because it's not right, how if many, it's true. How many of these cells do you have, these intensive supervision cells? Well, the unit itself has um, over 25 cells that are used for various purposes. The, the sort of the perspex type ones that you're talking about where you've got direct observation, um, off the top of my head, I can't give you the precise number. It would be around 20. And then how many staff are assigned on any shift to those particular unit? Uh, well, that varies. Uh, and again, I haven't got that figure in front of me, but um, look, it's usually um, one or two supervisors and a number of more junior sort of youth custodial staff um, providing uh, support. So probably around um, six to seven. I think it's up to a 10, but I'd have to check that. I honestly haven't got that figure in front of me. And, and Dr. Adam Thomason, you, you talked there about um, the, the extra staff you're trying to be, bring on. Is, is one of the reasons that this boy was in that, um, that cell for so long because it's an easier option when you're short-staffed? that it's it, 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 for your staff, 
it's easier to just put them in that cell and leave them there for as long as they need to be there because you no, just I... don't have enough staff to be managing them in the general area. No, I don't think that's the case. I mean, certainly when we have we have less staff on a particular shift, what we'll do is we'll actually lock down particular units for particular periods of the day, and that's not an ideal circumstance because it can actually raise temperatures for the young people as well, and that's why I'm also looking at, you know, getting in more staff, plus we have um, prison officers um, assigned to banks here to sort of work on the perimeter to sort of free up more youth custodial staff for the unit work. I don't think that I don't think that is the case that the young person was left there just because it was easier for us. The young person was there. We actually want to graduate them back to sort of a more normal regime in other units, it's about behaviour and about managing that behaviour. And it's most likely going to be the case, and I haven't got the data, so I'm not saying this is 100% true. It's most likely the case at varying points this young person's been tried to sort of go to a different regime and that hasn't worked for various reasons and he's been kept back in the ISU. Now, I can't prove that's the case. That is the normal practice, though, is to graduate people in and out of that function, that feature, just because we want actually kids to be in their normal units rather than in the ISU as much as possible. So we'll try it. We'll, you know, we'll set conditions. We'll try and make manage behaviour whether they be um, self-harming or um, more disruptive behaviour. We want the kids to settle and have a better experience, not a, not a bad experience. And so we'll do the best we can to keep them out of ISU. We don't want them there, but it depends on uh, what's going on in the uh, infrastructure. But, but mainly it depends on whether that young person seems fit and able to take advantage of that regime and doesn't end up back there after committing, if you like, another uh, sort of uh, incident which we then need to respond to. So how many staff short are you at the moment? Well, I, I can't take, give you precise numbers because it changes day to day. Usually, about it's about sixty plus staff who um, run a shift inside banks here, and it, depending on the, on what goes on at the day, we may be down to um, you know twenty. Uh, Around 30 staff would be a bad day. Now, that can be affected by workers' compensation claims. We have a number of staff who've been assaulted and have then uh, gone on workers' compensation uh, because of the uh, assaults they've experienced inside banks here. We have other staff who may be absent because of personal leave or other circumstances, uh, and we try and bolster that wherever we're able to, and we run a, a regime that allows us to make the facility function uh, with whatever number of staff we have. And how many people in Banksy Hill at the moment? 140. And and is that is that sort of at capacity? No, it's not. The banks here can have um, quite a large number more than that, which we don't actually want. And in fact, in the last since I've been in the department, which um, I took over at Corrective Services in early 2017, when there were actually some riots going on at banks at the time, and the fact the number of young people in banks here at that point was actually much higher. Banks here can hold as many as 215. Um, so it's about 65% occupancy at the moment. But until about two months ago, we had about 100 kids in Banksia, and that was actually something we were aspiring to, was to keep the numbers much lower, because it means we're better able to deal with the young people we've got in our care. Um, but we've seen a, a rise in offending in the community, and that's translating into more young people on remand in Banksia, and also uh, more young people being sentenced to uh, a period of detention in Banksia as well. And again, um, you would know that, there, especially around summer, it's often the case, and it's certainly been the case this year, um, that there has been a rise in some youth offending in parts of the uh, community in WA. Uh, particularly in the northwest at the moment. I know there's a lot of issues mm -hmm. around yep. the Pilbara and the Kimberley. I'll yep. leave it there. I do appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr Adam Thomason there. He's the Director General of the Justice Department. It is uh, 12 minutes to nine on ABC Radio Perth and WA. Uh, I want to go to uh, Karen and then I'm going to go to Ricky Hendon. She uh, rep is part of the union that represents some um, staff out at Banksia Hill. Um, Karen, good morning to you. Morning, Nadia. What did you want to say? Nadia, 12 months ago, approximately, mm -hmm. uh, a young relative of mine, um, I have to be a bit careful to protect sure. her, yep. went in uh, as a professional into Bankshire Hill and I caught up with her that evening and she was uh, distressed. She had gone in there. Um, she had seen a person whom had uh, either... A, actually not sure whether he had attempted suicide or definitely had suicidal tendencies. Mm -hmm. He was in solitary, was the way she put it. Now, whether he was in the same glass cage that, that, that you're talking about, the, the person... Intensive was in supervision, the, yep, yep. Yes, uh, sorry. That's okay. um, and she was just traumatised. And when she questioned why, she was told that, well, there's only one resident psychologist in here. And she was just flabbergasted and i'm listening to this conversation thinking it's all 
facts and figures and data and, you know, these young people commit offences. This is the best we can do. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and let's make the point, a lot of people uh, that are texting through, and, and good to talk to you, Karen, thank you for that. I don't have much sympathy for this kid, but they've come from damaged homes, absolutely. They're already damaged. They have a range of behavioural disorders, of psychological disorders. Um, a lot of them have fetal alcohol syndrome disorder. So, yes, they need help. And as Cindy points out on the text, juvenile detention is a complex issue. And it is. This young person referred to needs a range of supports, medical and psychological. Is this facility the correct place for him? Are we expecting facility staff to be able to provide services that they aren't trained or aren't equipped to provide? The detainees and the staff both need to be appropriately supported. Um, Cindy, thank you. And that boy has been released. Um, he was released yesterday into the care of his grandmother because Judge Quayle felt that that was a better option for him than keeping him in Banksy Hill. I just want to go to uh, Ricky Hendon. Uh, she is the WA Secretary of the Public Sector Union, which does represent youth uh, custodial officers at Banksy Hill. Um, Ricky, good morning to you and thank you uh, for your time today. Thanks, Nadia. Thanks for having me on. Uh, well, you've been listening to the Director General's comments. Um, do you accept and uh, what he is saying this morning and the pressures that they're under, and and how do you respond? Well, I think from our perspective, it was interesting to hear the Director General say that uh, 30 would be a bad day in terms of the staffing at the centre. Um, it's always a bad day at the moment. Um, our members have been telling us that they are chronically short-staffed. If 30 is a bad day, 26 is an extremely bad day. And at the past weekend, there were 26 staff on at Bankshire Hill Detention Centre to uh, look after all of those uh, young people at the centre. It's really desperately unsafe for both staff and for the young people. And, and not uncommon, I understand, to be operating at that level? At the moment, no. So our members uh, have been raising concerns about safety at the centre for quite some time now. And they've been very clear that for the centre to be safely staffed, it needs to be underpinned by two principles, which is that there are two staff for every eight detainees uh, and that uh, there is no officer ever left alone, so that there's always two officers in every, every scenario. That's about making sure there's safety for the officers and safety for the, for the young people. Um, as uh, the Director General uh, referenced, there are quite a high number of um, staff assaults at the centre resulting in workers' compensation and absence. That's one of the drivers for the fact that the, um, the absences or the, uh, the staffing is so low, but it's also about the fact that um, there has, you know, and, and, and I appreciate that the department uh, has um, upped the number of of schools uh, that they run for youth custodial officers mm. to train more people. Um, but uh, it's, it is one of the drivers is the safety of the centre, why we have so few people um, working at the centre at the moment. And I think the issue is also if you want to attract and retain people, um, you know, getting new people to walk into an unsafe centre that's in crisis, um, you know, it's, it's not much of an incentive for them to stay on. Uh, Ricky Hendon, finally, do you accept the judge's comments that uh, the treatment of this 15-year-old boy was uh, dehumanising, uh, illegal, um, his words, and this is from somebody who knows the law better than most of us, um, and, you know, made that point that if you if you treat a damaged child like an animal, they'll behave like one? Uh, what I think is that... Did, did, did staff there fail this boy? I don't think staff have failed the boy. I think the staff are desperate to do the fullness of their job um, when we speak to our members. Uh, our members, by the way, youth custodial officers, don't only guard young people. They actually are supposed to provide rehabilitative um, programs for them and help them through their rehabilitation. And they're very frustrated that they're not, going to, they're not able to really do that job. Um, they're only able to do the very basics, which is to keep the basics of the centre safe. Um, with such low staffing, it means that the young people, to make the centre safe, are in lockdown a lot of the time. Um, and obviously that means, as, as has been mentioned, that temperatures do rise in the centre and behaviour does escalate in the centre. But our members are left with very few options in terms of safety to take young people out of the cells when there are so few st so few staff, um, you know, jeopardises uh, safety in the centre. And they are frustrated that they don't get to do the work that they want to do, which is making sure that young people leave the centre better off, that they don't offend again, uh, and that they've had the support that they need to turn their lives around. I'll leave it there. I do appreciate your time there. Uh, Ricky Hendon, uh, she's the WA Secretary of the Public Sector Union, which represents uh, those officers at Banksia Hill. Uh, can take calls on this after 9 o'clock, 1300 222 720.